Hi, welcome back to The Reboot Show. I'm Sally A. Illingworth, your host. And today I'm excited because I'm joined by a couple of panelists to have a discussion about marketing and technology. Today, we've got Zora Artis, who is a strategic brand marketing communication and business alignment leader and the CEO of Artis Advisory. And we've got David Fairfall, who is a social media marketing and technology expert and the CEO and co-founder of Metagy. And we're also joined by Amy, who is a resident panelist here at The Reboot Show. So welcome, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. To get started, um, I'd love to hear from yourself, David. Um, how have you seen marketing um, and communication, if you like, evolve in recent years? Well, that's a really broad question, but I think it's a really interesting one, right? Um, uh, look, if I go back to, you know, even a few years ago, uh, my original background was uh, running digital for McCann Erickson. So it was very advertising centric and, and still very broad in terms of the way we would apply, you know, a marketing strategy to digital. digital, And that really evolved quite a lot between the, the period from there to when I was uh, started with um, We Are Social, um, where it became very socially centric and very real time in terms of context and, and very oriented around, you know, connecting with an individual you know, consumer in a really tangible, logical way and responding one-on-one. -on -one. And, and that was a real shift between, you know, broad-based communication down to very one-on-one -on -one and dealing with a customer in real time. And I think that's even evolved further because the application of technology to the ability to be able to understand a lot more about that individual consumer or customer and, and to, to really, you know, see more of the background and delve into that detail with that particular customer and apply logic to the way you talk to groups and sets of customers, that, that's been a, a major shift in the last few years and really changed the mm. way um, a marketing team has to be structured and the expertise you need to be able to think, you know, from a broad-based strategy down to a tactical one-on-one -on -one conversation. I think you raise a great point because it's, it's those capabilities that actually allow the marketing function to become more effective. Um, and maybe from your perspective, um, Zora, in, in terms of, to what David was speaking about in terms of maybe being able to be a little bit more specific and speak one-on-one -on -one, um, and have a more tactical approach to, to marketing and communications. Do you feel like in recent years, marketing and, and more broadly communications um, has become a more important part, a more important business function, given sort of improvements to our capabilities? I think it has from the perspective of really needing to be part of uh, driving growth um, in, in an organisation or for the business. And also how you bring together different parts of the business. So communications, for example, has a really integral role with, within culture. Um, as well as alignment within an organisation. So aligning back to the corporate strategy and ensuring that all the employees in an organisation actually know what their role is in delivering that strategy and understanding how important the customers actually are to the organisation and what role they play as part of the brand in delivering the brand experience to, uh, to the customers, whoever they might be, as well as the stakeholder engagement piece. So when I look at marketing, over the last few years, as well as communication, there's um, more of a uh, need to collaborate across functions um, within by both marketing and communications, but also with HR, strategy, finance, tech, all of those together to make sure that they're actually delivering the best they can. And there's always this tussle between the short term and the long term, you know, performance driven mm. marketing as well as the brand building aspect of marketing. I love, I love your highlighting uh, of the people component and, and maybe we could hear from you on that note, Amy. I know that you have uh, a lot of experience when it comes to HR uh, and people management and, and more specifically millennial development. So what are your thoughts in the context of marketing and technology, but also to what Zora is saying around the importance of people still in this process? Yeah, I guess, well, to Zora's point, you know, I'm with a HR background, I think that HR people need to think more like marketers. I think that's a, a really great way to do it. And, and that's that sort of integrated approach that Zora was touching on there. And I think, you know, with young people in particular, from a consumer point of view, there's a real low level of trust with brands. Like we're so used to getting sold to and all those sorts of things that you see pop up, particularly with social media now, there's so much noise out there. So we've really seen like the rise of influencer marketing. We've seen video content. We've seen marketing as a function 
really play more of an educational role um, in really sort of providing value and that personalized approach to David's point that he touched on as well uh, has been super important because consumers are, are not that forgiving, you know, when it comes to that marketing message now and brands will get called out on it. So I think, you know, that's been a really important shift that we've seen happening as well. I was just going to make a comment on that. When you say brands will get caught out on it, that's um, a major trend that's been emerging over the last oh, at least five years. So mm. there's a trend that's been identified called glass box brands. Mm. So once upon a time, you know, we used to try and control a brand. Um, yeah. These days you can't. You can't because you've got this transparency element and you've got incredible connection across the board. So whatever a brand is doing or an organisation is doing within the business, if there is some sort of scandal or some sort of issue or if a brand is not really being true to its purpose, its values, mm. it can be seen from outside. So customers, st external stakeholders will make a judgment on that brand based on what's happening internally. An example of that, for example, is um, AMP recently. So, you know, AMP Capital brought in a new CEO who um, a number of years ago had an issue with sexual harassment. The woman that was harassed actually left the organisation. He remained and he's now the CEO of AMP Capital. Mm. The employees were very peeved by that whole situation. It was all across the, you know, the cover of the AFR um, or the Australian Financial Review. So as a consequence, there, there are some major players in that organisation that actually walked out and left mm -hmm. and now they're trying to deal with that. So that has a significant impact on the brand. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great example. Um, and, you know, I think the, one of the key themes that's coming out here is the importance of sentiment, but also how you can't really control sentiment as much as maybe you once could. So from your perspective, David, um, I know that I'm familiar with, for example, certain sentiment monitoring tools and analytics and whatnot, um, particularly in the public relations space. But in your experience, uh, where have you seen technology sort of transform marketing and communications the most? I think that varies depending on size of organisation. Obviously, if we talk to an enterprise customer, uh, certainly one of the shifts that, that I've seen in, in recent years is is a shift to control the technology rather than you know outsource the the gathering of that intelligence and the, and the functional feedback into the business. So, so a marketing team becoming empowered to really drive and manage that process with, with direct control of the technology, therefore direct insights into you know the experience and integration and interface with the customer. So that that's been a major transition. And what that leads to, I think, is real time decision making, which really leads to you know the logic of maybe a strategy was set and set and followed through with over a period of time and you could pretty much run a course and measure that historically whereas now i think there's a an overarching logic around strategy but a whole bunch of micro moments that real-time data provide so for the brand and the team running the brand to be able to really you know deviate or delve into the real opportunities right to, to write mm -hmm. particular conversational trends or particular cycles that zora mentioned to where something's happening in real time and we've all, you know, we've all seen fantastic examples of that done really well and some fantastic examples of it done really poorly. Um, and, and so you can't sit and forget anymore. You've got to transition into a, a real-time thinking mode of, of both being responsive and, and more importantly, being reactive and opportunistic around the things that really rise, that rise to the surface from time to time. And I think, you know, sentiment as a barometer or brand behaviour or brand ethics or brand, you know, context and storytelling is is the that that's really been changed because it's become far more contextual and personal and far more real time yeah I love so your, spot on. yeah yeah i love your reference to, to context i'm a huge fan of context and everything being contextually relevant um but amy i'd love to hear from you david raises a really good point around maybe some of the um the pressures but also um improvements and opportunities for say people in the marketing function of a business um, or even just the communications aspect of a business so from a leadership standpoint what are some things that leaders need to really consider when it comes to taking their marketing personnel along on that journey 
given there is so much disruption to the way that we are marketing. And as David highlighted, no longer can we really afford to put in place a strategy that's set and forget. We need to be more agile. We need to be more adaptive. Um, and as a result, there's a lot more pressure there. Yeah. Interestingly enough, I was reading a report recently by Forrester and it mentioned that actually two thirds of marketing professionals now see that the use and understanding of marketing technology tools is actually a crucial component of their role. So already there's that sense that we need to know this and we need to be using this and adopting this because it's actually going to help us. So I think from a leadership point of view, using the software and not just throwing a technology tool at people, but rather allowing them to see how it's going to help them to make better decisions to David's point, you know, help them identify the buying journey of their customers and make little tweaks along the way that it's actually going to make their life easier. It's going to make a bigger impact with their customer as well. It's going to make their interactions easier. Um, from a leadership standpoint, I think that's a really important thing is to really understand the day-to-day -day role of those people and how that technology solution is actually going to help them be more creative, create more meaningful moments with their customers along the way too. It'd be great to hear your thoughts as well, Zora, just an extension to that on the strategy piece. So, um, you know, I firmly believe that marketing has very much been sort of democratized, if you like. So there's obviously growing pressure on people in those specialties um, to sort of adapt themselves and, and embrace technology and whatnot. And as David mentioned, um, sort of, you know, real time, um, you know, ability uh, to respond to what's happening in a market. So what are your thoughts from a strategy development perspective and maybe some approaches to developing strategies in today's marketing landscape? Well, I think what's really important is actually understanding what problem you're trying to solve or what your opportunity mm -hmm. actually is in the first place and ascertaining what you want to achieve from the objectives perspective. So not just in terms of outputs, but also in terms of outcomes and thinking about your customer or um, your particular audience and putting them at the centre of what you're doing. So really understanding that. Um, the part that I, I really think is important from a strategic perspective is looking at what are what does the what does the insights or what do the insights actually tell us? Um, and sometimes I find that people don't necessarily know how to connect the dots. So it is about from a strategic perspective, it is about looking at that holistic piece, thinking back to the business problem that you need to solve and what your marketing or communication opportunity is for that specific audience. The initiatives that you have in there, as David said, you do need to be more agile and re-evaluate as you're going. So the metrics piece is critical and you need to think about what are the metrics at the beginning of the process, what is that going to be? It's going to help you evaluate how you're doing along the way, what needs to change, what you need to adapt. And don't be afraid to kill off the darlings if you need to. Yeah. <laughs> because sometimes people invest so much time and they own something and they just can't, can't get rid of it. Mm. And if it's not working, it's not working. And you just have to accept that and move on. So I used to run agencies as well. And I had digital teams, um, you know, very much into that agile space. And you, you can't have, you don't have perfect information all the time. You can't wait for that. We're no. in the, you know, the VUCA environment at the moment, you know, the, you know, we've got a lot of uncertainty and all that sort of thing. I'm currently in the middle of responding to COVID with, with the government here on, with, in the health and human services area, so strategic communications, every day something changes. You need to twist, turn, adapt. You don't have everything on hand. The people need to be able to think differently, think on their feet and be really resilient and mm -hmm. have capability across a whole range of different things. It's just incredible how people can come together if you give them the right space and their training and you trust them to do their work. Yeah, I love the reference to trust. And I think particularly during the COVID period, we've seen sort of an 
an elevator acid transformation in terms of what it means to actually trust your teams, uh, you know, in an organization environment. So, um, David, I'd love to hear from you just in terms of this, you know, approach to marketing with continuous improvement, um, continuous adaptation um, and sort of re-evaluation of what your strategies are um, and what your tactics are, what's working, what's not working. Um, and thanks to technology, we have a lot of capabilities to do yeah. that quite quickly and easily. Um, I'm a, a huge fan of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and I know that everyone's probably well aware that um, they're becoming increasing sort of aspects of, you know, technology stacks, if you like, for different solutions. So what are your thoughts on the role of um, artificial intelligence and or machine learning specifically um, in the context of marketing and supporting that role from a, a real time perspective? Yeah, well, I mean, that's obviously a topic fairly dear to my heart, given what we're doing. So for those that don't know, Medigy is, uh, it's an SME targeted solution, but we use AI and machine learning to really, you know, deliver the strategy component, if you like, the, the solution that SMEs can't afford through a traditional agency model. But most importantly, it's about empowering, you know, a market or even an inexperienced or non-specialist marketer to really shift from that, that traditional challenge of marketing of coming up with a strategy and then, you know, deploying and then historically reviewing to the logic of being able to optimize in real time. And I think that's the real shift or the application for AI, right? And if you look at the context of COVID, I think, you know, as a marketer, you probably had a playbook of rules that were pretty much logically, you know, consistent. The more you understood about your customer base, you could deploy and, and you'd have a fairly good hunch around the way they might behave or react or, or engage and what outcomes you would get from it. But COVID pretty much turned everything on its head. And, mm. and so, you know, I think it's a perfect application to go that, that AI is, is a very powerful tool for thinking about real-time optimization rather than deploying and seeing the historical results and then deciding whether or not you should have adapted, right? So I think that's a perfect application. And, and the other logical thing that I think, you know, if I go to the core of, if there's any resistance around the application of AI and machine learning, it's generally a, a sense of dread or fear that's going to you know, impact upon you know, my role as a marketer or whatever the context is, but certainly in marketing. Whereas what we actually find is that it's empowering, right? Because you know, the logic of great technology, uh, regardless of what the experience from a sci-fi perspective is, it's yeah. very much around taking away the, the mundane or boring parts of many roles and let's be honest, I love data, but even I hate looking at that range of data. I'd rather get to the inside or get to the real, you know, the opportunity for how do I improve or, or adapt my original thought and deploy something that's going to be more effective. And I think yeah. it does that incredibly well. And, you know, while I'm building on the logic of that, it, it, it importantly empowers the creativity, right? Mm -hmm. So the ability to be able to think laterally, to do great creative and then deploy and experience and adapt and iterate on that, right? So a great idea becomes really powerful because data helps us get to the core of what was working and how do we tweak it and improve it as we go. So, yeah. And on that note, Amy, I'd love, I'd love to hear from you. I know you speak a lot about technology enabling, um, you know, the, the human workforce, if you like, to focus on more meaningful work, I think is a really key word there. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, to David's point, it's, you know, really bringing in that personalised approach to it as well. You know, it's cutting through, you know, what could take eight hours for an employee to do in 15 minutes to get to those insights faster and therefore better be able to meet their customer where they are. And in an ever-changing environment like we are through COVID, that has to happen. You know, you're going to really look uh, quite silly if you're uh, having a marketing message that's six months old now because it's just not going to be relevant. It's not going to resonate. Um, and so it does open up your employees to, you know, do some more creative things and actually uh, like growth hacking, for instance, you know, it's kind of like the buzzword of the last few years and Hotmail used this uh, years ago, I think in 1994 was one of the first people to do some growth hacking. And what that was, was kind of like word of mouth on steroids. You know, they, they, when they sent out an email, it had that little uh, PS, by the way, if you love this email, sign up here. And so many technology companies are using that sort of marketing now and they have the freedom to get creative and to get, uh, to be more innovative um, because their time is freed up through these sort of automation and technology tools. So I think it's, uh, we, we take it for granted sometimes, um, but I think it's super important. So as the relationship between human and technology is advancing, um, and in mo many cases to the, to the benefit of both technology and, and the human, if you like, 
Um, what this is doing is obviously changing the way in which we market and how marketing as a function, if you like, um, works in a business and, and how it actually plays out. So maybe it'd be great to hear from you to, to kickstart this part of the conversation, Zora, around maybe how some of these advancements to the, the capabilities of, say, technology in a marketing environment um, but also that changing um, sort of dynamic between human and tech in marketing. How is that impacting how we approach um, determining like relevant sort of return on investment um, considerations when it comes to marketing and communications? Well, I, I look at um, the use of technology and particularly AI and um, marketing of late. And I think of a couple of different things before I go to that. I think of ethics. Mm. As, as an important piece. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I did a piece of work with a colleague um, on AI and the impact on the communication sector. And a lot of people were considering, you know, uh, we're going to lose jobs, all this sort of stuff. And it's, um, you know, what is, what is the impact on the profession? Because you, you've got so many different things that um, AI can actually do these days that take away from those mundane tasks that David was talking about. And yes, it gives you much more time to do stuff that you can really love and you can actually focus on that strategic thinking piece. Um, but what is important is who is actually doing the ethical piece? Where is, how is the AI learning the ethics? Who's, who's plugging that into, into the machine learning and where is that data coming from? When I look at data, I also think about there's issues around the diversity aspect of, of data. There's um, mm. a huge piece of work um, that was uh, was done in the UK that looked at data and, uh, and AI and how it's actually, there's a lot of inequity built into it. So there's a whole range of different things that you do need to consider about that. So when I look at the human aspect, I think about the, the empathy piece, I think about the ethics piece and how that overlays across it. Um, the Also, the other piece that was really interesting from a data perspective is uh, privacy. And a number of um, years ago, I looked um, at GDPR and the impact of that and the need to switch to consent marketing and how that completely flips everything on its head. So I recall I, I was on the global board for the International Association of Business Communicators, which is a professional association globally, and we had to completely change how we did all our marketing, all our outbound marketing. Um, everything got flipped on its head. So there's a lot of impact on how you actually do business and how you actually market to consumers because you need their permission. That's a great point, Zora, because I think even now in my inbox, I still get emails that come through from all these different brands that I've never even subscribed to or never even heard of. Uh, it's frustrating, isn't it? And then you think, well, why are you sending me that? And in, in particular with COVID, you realised how many databases you were actually on based mm. on all these people so saying, true. you're really important to us. <laughs> we're looking after you. We care. And you're thinking, really? Yeah. Okay, delete, 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 delete. <laughs> this is the best way to clean out my um, inbox. Thank you. Yeah. It's COVID. And I think, um, you raise a really uh, interesting point, Zora, around um, biases um, and diversity as well, because from my understanding, and David could correct me if I'm wrong, but particularly when you're looking to use artificial intelligence, it's usually that foundational data that is really key. Um, for example, actually, um, I, I remember reading recently, Google uh, even had some, some issues with um, claims against them around certain biases that were built into the, um, the text predictions in their, their yeah. Gmail function. Um, and there were certain assumptions that, you know, this sentence is leading to speak about a female versus a male. Uh, and so they experienced all sorts of challenges there. Um, but to shift gears a little bit and just think about, um, so we've sort of touched briefly on the, uh, the return on investment aspect of things. Um, but now if we can sort of look at budgets. So maybe it'd be great to hear from you to start with, David, um, given your product, for example, is focused on SMEs. You mentioned uh, who maybe don't have the budget to invest in advanced technology. So... Uh, how is technology um, and maybe, for example, artificial intelligence and the capabilities there helping us to achieve maybe better efficiency so that we can actually um, afford to have a budget um, for these sorts of, sorts of things to transform our marketing? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting one, right? I suppose for, as a product proposition, we, we 
are doing a lot in that space. Uh, essentially, the focus, I think, for most SMEs and certainly the uh, opportunity we're trying to address is, is the transition from thinking of marketing spend as a budget and actually being focused as an investment. So the logic of actually really tangibly being able to measure ROI. And I know that's all been hypothetical, but actually technology is catching up to the point where you can connect enough data points and make a decision around agnostically. If I spend a dollar on this platform today, I'll mm -hmm. generate you know X dollars in sales. That's mm -hmm. not theoretical for a brand that wants to put the time and effort in and does have a digital transaction fulfillment, you can actually now measure that. So there's an entire shift from this is my marketing budget to, you know what, for every dollar I invest, I'm going to generate X in, um, you know, sales. So therefore mm. it becomes a cash flow question, not a budget question, right? Mm. If, if my lead time for an X to Y is, is, you know, six months, then I simply have to manage my cash flow because I know exactly what I'm getting out of every dollar that I spend. And that is a quantum shift in the way an SME thinks about, you know, their, their marketing program, right? It becomes, mm. well, how do I support that activity to get the outcome in the period of time? And that's mm. a very big... I think um, you're absolutely so. You're so right. I mean, it, it's it's an it's an excellent way to do it. You know, having run businesses um, myself, I I know how important the cash flow piece is in, in terms of the the whole equation, particularly now when you know we're going through you know recession. Um, and we'll be going through recession in the COVID normal for for a while. One of the things that I think is really important when it comes to people and capability, uh, whether you're in marketing or communications, is, is strong business acumen and mm. actually understanding how to speak the language of business, and that does mean numbers and not being afraid of numbers and understanding how it all fits, how it fits together. So when you are talking about what you were saying, David, in terms of the bottom line, you actually understand how it, how it all connects up. Um, and that is really important if you're going to go out and, and invest in technology as a marketer and you know it's going to achieve X, Y, Z for you and you need to put a business case together, you need to know how to do that. And that's a really important piece and sometimes I see a huge gap in that space. Mm. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I'd like to add one really relevant thing to what you were saying before, Zora, because I think that touches on it, right? The boardroom conversation five years ago was pretty much led generally by sales. Sales as a driver and then finance as a supporter to all of the planning. Whereas I see a significant shift to a marketer that fundamentally understands how to utilize technology, but talk about it in a context um, that actually is around business drivers and therefore finance is now leading that conversation because they are the driver at scale rather than you know a sales you know process which pretty much follows that transactional thinking, right? Mm. So yeah. that's a big shift. And to add to that, when you're talking to the boardroom, um, being on boards and um, that sort of thing, the other piece that I think is really important is to actually understand how to talk about it from a risk perspective. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, there is an opportunity cost. So risk isn't always negative. It can be positive if you know how to reframe it. Mm -hmm. So, you know... That business case piece, understanding the risk, if you do something or you don't do it, if you need to mitigate, um, there's a whole range of different ways to talk that and to get something across the line if you, if you really need that. Yeah. yeah. I think traditionally there's always been, I guess, that clash between the sales and marketing teams sometimes. And I think what's nice about technology is it does help to close that gap and bridges that gap and adds that transparency as well to that whole process. Because now we're seeing sort of 65% of the buying process is actually happening before it's even reached a salesperson. Yeah. So, and, and whether that salesperson, you know, could be a, a technology mechanism as well um, rather than an actual person now. So it's a really interesting uh, dynamic shift that you mentioned there, David, that I think uh, is really relevant too. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's ever been more relevant, right? The marketing yeah. journey is so digitally led and, and the advent of COVID has meant that traditional sales teams aren't even out in the field, right? That's it. So yeah. <laughs> if, that was your, if that was your driver before, you've really got to flip it around, right? And, right? and the marketer that understands that is leading that conversation for sure. Yeah. So on that note, can we, um, we're actually taking this in a really good direction here because my next question was going to be, and maybe start with yourself, Amy, around, 
you know, as we are becoming more digital, um, and I also want to mention that I love the point that you guys have highlighted that marketing can no longer be classified as just traditionally fluffy, because mm -hmm. I know in the marketing space, we've always been um, sort of victim to that. But to, to shift gears and focus on the customer for a moment, Amy, so you mentioned around uh, the, the customer buying journey, if you like, and how that's changed. So now uh, we focused a lot on the conversation around how technology is equipping the marketer, if you like, uh, with more precision and more insights. Um, but in that changing marketing dynamic, um, how is that also helping the customer in terms of them being able to actually communicate through technology um, to almost request indirectly better personalization from the companies that are marketing to them? Yeah, it's a great point. And it really uh, adds to that real time feedback that you can get, you know, when you jump onto someone's website now or different uh, social media sites as well, there's that instant chat ability that you can connect straight away with that brand. So I think you get that real time uh, feedback and you get your questions answered a lot quicker sometimes uh, through social media, through other technology solutions that are out there. So from a customer point of view, you feel more informed, uh, you feel more engaged and you feel like it, you're a part of that experience as well, you know, with that brand, because ultimately as a consumer, you know, you want to be a part of something bigger than yourself. You know, no one goes out to buy an Apple iPhone because it fits nicely in your pocket. Maybe you do, but mostly it's because you're a part of that brand and you want to change the status quo and you think of yourself as being creative and all those other great, you know, brand recognition things that are out there. So. I think, you know, it really helps with that information, that education piece, and it helps with that engagement and that real-time feedback as well. Like, I know even myself, if I put out a video, you know, content piece on LinkedIn, I get that real-time interaction with my market so that they feel like they already know me and they feel like they trust you. Um, and it adds to that credibility from a brand perspective as well. And I suppose from, a, from an advertising standpoint, I think there's certainly an interesting conversation to be had as well, um, going back to sort of return on investment metrics and whatnot, and the marketer being able to have that real-time insight. You know, even if you think about, say, social media advertising, you know, and the ability of the, the target customer, if you like, the persona, to be able to interact or not interact with a, a social ad, if you like, and therefore provide direct feedback to that marketer. Um, around whether or not they're targeting the right person effectively. Um, and I want to I raise this. Um, I believe it was uh, yourself, David, um, sort of prior to this panel discussion. So maybe we'll start with you, um, whereby you reference that, um, you know, it's no longer uh, so much about personas when it comes to designing your marketing strategy and thinking about who you're marketing to, but it's more so a matter of marketing towards behaviours. Did you want to explore that for, for us? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think persona still has its place and I don't mean to be dismissive of the logic of thinking that way, but, but I think it was, you know, a behavioral approach to marketing at a time when we, we had only broad data sets or we had, you know, say more traditional means of collecting data about customers. We didn't have the real time or the detailed, you know, connectivity that we have today with technology. And in fact, consumers that fundamentally expect that, and you touched on a moment ago with personalization, right? At the end of the day, if I share data with a brand, I'm actually now comfortable with that. I may have been mm. reluctant a few years, years ago to do that, but I'll do it now on the basis that I expect a better outcome from it. And there's an onus on the brand to in fact deliver a better, more personalized experience and heaven help them if they don't do that, yeah. because that's the incumbent requirement for doing that. But I think at that point, we, we no longer want to be categorised as, you know, I'm a 25-year-old male in marketing, right? Because I, my relationship with the brand is diverse. I, uh, you know, think about the way I engage with them differently on different channels. And I expect you to react and, and respond to that. Because and even time of day, I might be working with a brand in a particular context during the course of the day as part of my job. And my behaviour as a consumer at night is completely different again. So... It's no longer acceptable to think about, you know, personas as the appropriate categorization when we have so much more depth to the information we have about a specific customer. We should we need, we need to be able to respond and react to that appropriately, right? And I love the distinction between, say, my maybe professional uh, persona versus my personal persona because, you know, I very much appreciate and have learned that, you know, even in different uh, social media channel platform environments for example you know you as an individual when you're on linkedin for example you may be in one mindset from a social media marketing standpoint and what you're receptive to versus when you're on a facebook or an instagram so you actually expect different things in those environments because you almost wear different hats on each platform 
Um, I'm mindful of time. Um, so maybe to sort of start progressing towards um, wrapping this up, I'd love to hear from each of you. We might start with you, Zora, around what you think the, what does the future of communications look like, especially with technology in the picture? Oh, look, I think, it, I think you need to be really aware not to necessarily jump on the next shiny, bright new thing, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, sometimes happens. And um, I think it's, it's uh, the future is much more about um, being empathetic, really understanding your customer. And as David says, you know, it's important to actually understand that journey and the personalisation aspect of it as much as you can. Um, being really clear on your, I go back to the problem solving piece and that could be because I'm a strategist. So, you know, that's naturally part of my DNA, you know, looking to solve problems. Um, but really understanding how you align back to that, that corporate um, strategy overall and how you're going to be able to contribute to the, uh, to the growth of the business. Yeah. Um, or help the business innovate, help the business um, change as it needs to, help the business adapt as it needs to through looking at what's happening outside your space. Where can you actually get inspiration uh, for uh, new innovations, potentially looking at the trends and what can you do and bring that back into the business? So be curious. Yeah. Um, and really look for new ways of doing things. Don't, don't sit on your laurels. Mm -hmm. you, you need to be constantly learning. Lifelong learning is a passion of mine. So I think it's really important to keep doing that as you go. I love that. Um, and to, as we're sort of working to wrap up, we might shift gears um, a little bit with you, Amy, in closing um, from your perspective um, around more so what does the future of marketing look like for the marketer from, from a human resource standpoint? Yeah, I think it, uh, Zora said, you know, that lifelong learning piece is huge. And I think that's for, you know, people um, in those roles as well, because the landscape is going to continually shift. So uh, get used to it <laughs> because it's not going away. Um, and so I think you do need to be, you know, really passionate about what you do and put the customer at the center. I think all too often it can be about numbers and growth and hitting your KPIs and all those sorts of things, which are super important. But at the end of the day, there needs to be that empathy, that authenticity um, and that impact with the customer because they do expect it now and their expectations are only going to increase as well over time. And for you, David, in closing, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the future of marketing um, from the perspective of technology. And what are you excited about? Yeah, I suppose we spent a lot of time thinking about that particular topic, right? So I think at the end of the day, technology is moving at pace in every industry, right? But marketing is, there seems to be no throttles on it at the moment. It's, it's a key driver of business and that's why there's significant investment in it. Um, I think from a individual market perspective, it is about embracing the fact that technology is now part of your core function. Mm -hmm. And once upon a time, marketing perhaps relied on the technology component in the business to support that. Whereas I think now marketers are driving that technology discussion because they are the interface with the customer and the logic and strategy that they deploy is going to change that customer engagement and hence drive the business. And, and technology really is, you know, trying to work at pace to fill in those key, you know, requirements around ROI, you know, real-time thinking, you know, and tactically how do we leverage human creativity? And that's really where there's a lot of money and effort being spent to support those three key objectives. I love that. And I think that's a really strong note to close on in terms of leveraging um, human creativity. Because I think technology very much makes us fearful that the human will be made redundant. Um, but um, with specifically artificial intelligence is very much an extension of human intelligence. So thank you very much to all of you today, Zora, David and Amy. Um, and I'm sure our audience have enjoyed this discussion as well. Please do make sure that you subscribe to the Reboot Show YouTube channel and we'll see you on the next segment. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.